so good evening everyone and thank you very much for that introduction john much appreciated um uh, the, the, the aim of tonight is to talk about head injuries and just talk about the journey that patients go on from the point of their injury um, to where they uh, come into critical care and we'll talk about things on the way. Uh, so my day job is that I'm a consultant in neuroanesthesia and critical care at the Walton Centre in Liverpool. So if you're from out of the area, the Walton Centre is a dedicated neurosciences hospital, so we don't do anything other than um, brains and backs. Um, I've got a couple of other different hats as well. Um, I, uh, I'm a volunteer for CSI Basics, uh, Cheshire and Shropshire Immediate Care Group, which is um, where I've uh, uh, met John and where I've been uh, very ably mentored by him for the last uh, couple of years. Um, I'm also a volunteer for Cheshire Search and Rescue and um, I'm a merit doctor for Northwest Ambulance Service and uh, so from September I'm going to be joining the ranks at uh, Great North Air Ambulance. Um, so I, I get this quite unique opportunity of seeing patients you know, from the roadside all the way through their journey um, into critical care. So this is this is that journey. It's uh, the point of injury, uh, what we do at the roadside and how we transport those patients in, what happens in the emergency department. Um, and just noting that the, I think the vast majority of you watching are um, paramedics. So what you see probably stops at what the emergency department do so it might be quite interesting for you well i hope it's interesting for you uh, to see what happens in the operating theater and then what happens on intensive care afterwards the focus of this talk is going to be on the serious head injured patients as well uh, and we have got a very brief um segue into uh, minor head injuries and antiplatelet therapies because that is something that i've been asked um, specifically if i could address so what's the burden of head injury why why make a fuss about it why talk about it well between 2016 and 2017 there was just under 156,000 admissions due to head injury and those are admissions to the emergency department if you see that's about two-thirds um male well why why two-thirds male well blokes do stupid things um are much more likely to do silly things, much more likely to be involved in high energy road traffic collisions, much more likely to be involved in violence and also industrial accidents as well. Um, it's got two peaks of frequency, um, the young and the old. So our classic serious head injured patient is the young male, um, which puts them in the same subgroup as most major trauma um, categories. Now, this does put a huge burden on emergency departments and any acute trusts, including ambulance trusts. Um, and with, as with any health problem, it's got significant personal and wider economical burdens. Um, and whenever you have anything that's got such a big burden, you get really good support groups. Um, so uh, this is a headway and they provide help and support for families and people who are living um, with the aftermath of brain injuries. So what happens to people with brain injuries? Well, thankfully, very, very few of them die. It's got a very low incidence of death. Now, this is 0.2% of all A&E attendances with head injury will die as a result, but that doesn't include all the head injuries that aren't presented to A&E. So it's, probably, it's an even smaller fraction of that. But I don't think that figure really tells the whole story about head injuries. Because when you think about the implication of somebody dying and the cost of that to the economy versus somebody surviving, it's always the survivors which will have much, much greater costs uh, to the economy. Um, and that's been estimated to be about £15 billion a year in the UK. And this guy, Michael Parsonage, who works for the Centre for Mental Health, has done a really clever um an in-depth analysis of how much it costs for a single 15 year old who requires hospitalization for a head injury and then the subsequent interventions required even after discharge from hospital and the impact on mental health and that ongoing issue um, and he's come up with a, a figure of 155,000 pounds and that's just for one patient so if we get into the meat and veg of it uh, we can look at the mechanisms of a head injury now, I think the important thing to say is I've, I've 
got these groups here, but there is just a massive overlap between these groups. Blunt, blunt head impact, blunt trauma. These are often the ones that are associated with skull fractures and overlying scalp injuries. Um, acceleration, deceleration injuries. They're, again, they're very similar, but you can quite often get coexisting C-spine injuries and have two sites of injuries in the brain as the brain moves forward on um, the initial movement, hits the front of the skull, and then as the head whip, whips back, the brain hits the back of the skull. So that's called a contra coup injury. And I've got some CT scans later on uh, where you can see that. Uh, just skipping to the last one. Um, it's, uh, it's quite subtle. But if you see there, this is a, a good example of a penetrating injury. Um, these are fairly rare. However, in the last 18 months, I've seen two crossbow bolts um, in the head. Um, and when I say the head, I mean into the brain. Um, and one piece of wrought iron from a hanging basket. So although it is rare, it is a definite, uh, definite part of uh, head injuries. Um, and blast wave. And the reason why I've left blast wave to last is because it really is a combination of the previous three. The initial uh, blast wave can give you an acceleration, deceleration injury. Large chunks of debris can follow and cause a blunt impact. And small pieces of shrapnel can follow after that and cause penetrating brain injuries. So let's look at a scenario. Um, this is a car versus pedestrian, uh, and it comes through as unconscious. Uh, I think this is a, a fairly common cat one that lots of people are dispatched to uh, up and down the country and, and further afield. Uh, so you, you go there on your blue lights with your sirens blare, blaring um, and you are greeted with uh, uh, two things. One is what is a fantastic example of a bullseye on the windscreen. So if we talk about reading the scene, it doesn't get any clearer than that. That's where the patient's head has impacted the vehicle. There's going to be a serious head injury here. But the patient we were told was unconscious by the time we get there, eight, nine minutes later, and they're agitated. They're trying to sit up. Their eyes are open. They're just not really, they're making sort of incomprehensible sounds, moans and groans. And they're not following verbal commands, but they're definitely localizing. So our GCS is 11. They're resisting though, any interventions. They're not having a blood pressure put on. They don't want a cannula put in. They keep taking the oxygen mask off. And you can see that their head is clearly covered in blood. So there's a reason why I've chosen this scenario. Um, one is because it's very common. And secondly, because this is a scenario that I find very difficult to deal with. Um, it, it's, it's very tricky when you've got that person who's really resisting those interventions that you know they need. Um, it, interestingly, if you uh, want to see unconscious people from uh, car and motorbike accidents, you need to go and do some motorsport medical cover. By the time we get there as uh, basic doctors or HEMS crews or paramedics, that five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten minutes or even longer has gone by. And we do often find that patients are no longer unconscious. Uh, motorsport's quite unique because it's really hyper acute. You're there within seconds or a couple of minutes of the injury. So we do see a lot more unconscious patients in motorsport. So what are the principles of managing this obviously head injured patient well no surprise it's the same it's the same as what we do for every other trauma patient it's the same as atls attack phtls principles it's cabcd the goals aren't changed however what has changed is how we get there and we might just need to adapt a few things to get those those goals ticked off and achieved and get our primary survey done and I think one of the things that causes the most anxiety is sedation in these patients. And broadly speaking, I think you've got two, two options when you have your agitated head injured patient at the roadside uh, to sedate them or to wait and see how they get on. And this is very much an on the ground decision. You can usually get an idea fairly quickly about the trajectory that the patient is going in. If you're first on scene, 
you can get some really useful information from the bystanders and stuff. How was the patient just before I got here? How were they at the time of injury if you saw it? If you're the second crew there, speak to the first crew and you can start to build a picture in your mind regarding this patient's uh, conscious level, their agitation, are they getting better, worse, more quiet, less quiet. Now, you've, there are only three outcomes. They're either going to get better and more manageable. They're going to get worse. Uh, they might get more unconscious and become more manageable or they're going to stay the same. Now, the most important thing is that you don't wait too long to try and gather that information. Increased time on scene, we know, is not a good thing, and then we lead to potentially more damage. If we think about the phrase of time is brain, it certainly applies. Now, sedation is a real difficult thing, I think. And, oh, sorry, I think I've just uh, gone off my screen. There we go. Sorry about that. Um, sedation is a really difficult thing and if I was a vet I'd have a really easy life with my sedation. Um, I had to be issued with a rifle um, and a dart, uh, I'd hang out of a helicopter and I'd fly over the savannah and take a little pop shot and uh, everything would be great. Uh, and as a point of interest the, the drug they use is Immobilon which I think is a fantastic example of uh, doing what it says on the tin. And that's a combination of two drugs, atorphine, which is a wide ranging uh, opioid receptor agonist. So it doesn't just work at the mu opioid receptor that provides pain relief, it works at all of them to include sedation. And a drug called acepromazine, which is a really old school 1950s antipsychotic that we don't really use in humans anymore. And if you see any old films, um, such as One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, the, white, the, 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 the man who comes in the white coat and uh, jabs the patient in the arm and they collapse the foot, it's probably acepromazine that's used. But that's enough of what we don't have. Well, what do we have? Now, I mentioned morphine because morphine's a, a really good, it, 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 morphine's got a, real, a lot of really good stuff going for it. It's carried by most registered professionals. So it's wide ranging. And especially if you've got a polytrauma patient, so not just the isolated head injury, but they've got a pelvis, a femur, they've got rib fractures, they're going to be in an awful lot of pain. And I think it's important to acknowledge that pain is a real contributor to agitation. So if we can provide good analgesia and a bit of sedation for morphine, we might find that that patient then becomes a lot more easier to manage. We can provide it IM. It comes fairly concentrated, 10 milligrams in a mil. So it's pretty, pretty good to give IM. We don't have to give large volumes intramuscularly. It's not ideal. And I am not in any way suggesting that IM morphine in major trauma is an ideal situation. I'm, I'm not suggesting that at all. I'm just saying this is one of the options that you've got. And then we have to consider, well, you know, JR Calc tells us that we don't give morphine if the systolic's less than 90. And we've got someone here who's sat up and he's not letting us take the blood pressure. So we don't know. We do have a radial pulse though. So if our radial pulse is there, we can be fairly confident that at least we say, well, it's probably over 80. So this is definitely one of those calls, your trauma cell, your trauma desk, your senior clinicians. Of, I think the benefit of getting some analgesia on this guy might outweigh the potential risks. And those risks are the risk of hypotension. We can vasodilate, cause a bit of histamine release. We've also got the risk of respiratory depression and, you know, I am anything in major trauma is potentially quite unpredictable. So that brings us on to midazolam. Now, the thing about midazolam is you do need to be aware in a polytrauma patient, you are not providing any pain relief. So that's OK as long as you're not giving it with the intention of providing pain relief to someone who's got multiple very painful injuries. So this might be a better option in our isolated head injury. And again, you're going to need either your advanced paramedics, consultant paramedics, or enhanced care teams or HEMS teams to give this if this is outside of your scope of practice. Midazolam does run the risk of a little bit of hypotension, probably a little bit less than morphine does. Um, and it can obtunge your airway reflexes as well if it's overdone. So you need to be prepared to manage these things. Um, same with morphine. If you're going to give morphine, you're going to give midazolam. You need to be prepared to manage and support a patient's airway. 
And you also need to be prepared to boost that blood pressure back up with a bolus of ideally blood if you're a HEMS service or a, an enhanced care service or some salty water um, if that's what you've got in the back of your ambulance, your car or your RRB. Um, which brings me on to ketamine. Now, ketamine in head injuries. Traditionally, the thought is that um, there's a risk to raised intracranial pressure in giving ketamine. Uh, but if we think about the positives in this situation, uh, it doesn't cause drops in blood pressure. It doesn't decrease respiratory rate. It doesn't decrease airway reflexes. So those things sound really, really ideal for head injury. So that brings me quite nicely onto my first controversy that I want to talk about tonight. Now, ketamine is a really old drug um, and I've heard it referred to before now as um, a drug of war. Uh, it was extensively used throughout history in, in wars. In particular, you know, the Falcons War was where it really kind of got a, got a foothold as a, a drug that's great in major trauma. Um, it's quite interesting in that it's got three distinct doses. It's got the analgesic dose, it's got the sedation dose, and it's got the anesthesia dose, which use is quite varied depending on the amount of the drug that you give. Now, what I find is that hospital practitioners are very much stuck in the past with ketamine. Um, I, well, I, I started my training in 2010 and I was told very clearly you never give ketamine in a head injured patient. It rises the ICP, causes the pressure in the brain, in the skull to go up. You could kill someone with a head injury if you give them ketamine. And straight in front of us, I put a screenshot of the BNF. So this is the Bible when it comes to drugs, what we can and can't do. And right there in black and white, not under cautions, but under contraindications, do not do this. It clearly says head trauma raised into cranial pressure. Now, that so we've got certain hospital clinicians who are saying this is a really bad idea, and we've got the BNF backing them up. Now, this evidence comes from the 1970s, and there's a lot of problems with this. The numbers of people in these studies from the 1970s that said ketamine did this was very low. And we're talking about 16 people, I think, in, the, in the, the main study that this comes from. This was not looking at trauma patients. So, that was, you know, we, we've got uh, a very different patient group. They were looking at patients that had obstructive CSF lesions. And what they actually measured in, this, uh, in the study was not intracranial pressure. They measured changes in cerebrospinal fluid pressure at the bottom of the back in the lumbar spine. And then everyone just extrapolated that up. Well, well if it's increasing the pressure down there, it must increase the pressure up there. So don't use it, stay away from it. So let's look at what the modern evidence says. Well, ketamine in 2022, the first thing to say is that it is used every single day to provide pain relief, sedation and anesthesia for patients with traumatic brain injuries. This is not a left field thing. You're not out there on your own if you're using this drug for this purpose. I found a review article that's very recent. It's 2021, it's just over a year old. And I've put in the, uh, the key points here because what this review article has done is it synthesized all the studies that, that have been done in recent years. And the take home message is intracranial pressure remains unchanged or decreases associated with increases in cerebral perfusion pressure, which I'll talk about um, in the next couple of slides. Cerebral oxygenation remains unchanged and ketamine does not compromise autoregulatory mechanisms. It decreases seizures and has neuroprotective effects. If if there's anything more obvious and clear than that, I, I don't know what to I don't know what to say. And in fact, since I wrote this presentation about four weeks ago, there has been another study published um, in uh, uh, April 2022. So the evidence is mounting and mounting and mounting, and we're we're hopefully I think getting to a turning point where guidelines and things like uh, JR Calc and the BNF will catch up to where we are now.
But what I have done is I've just included a little caveat on the bottom of this. And this is something that I do sort of try and live by and I'm providing a bit of a counterpoint to my own argument here. When you're in a stressful situation, the best drug is not something that you've never used before and you're unfamiliar with. It's usually the drug that you're most familiar with. You're very familiar with a drug, how it works, how to give it and what doses to give. You can usually make it work in that stressful situation. So that's just my caveat um, to that. Now, cerebral physiology and pathophysiology, it's really important to try and understand what happens in the brain uh, and in the skull when it's been rattled around a little bit, because this is relevant to what we do at the roadside at this very, very early part of the patient's journey. So the brain behaves like a starling resistor. Now, what a starling resistor is, if you think of a very simple model, two rigid pieces of plastic pipe, and then in the middle, those two rigid pieces of pipe are joined by a bit of rubber hosing. Imagine something like your garden hose where you can squeeze and pinch it and you can manipulate the pressure within it. That is essentially how blood, throat, blood flow behaves through the brain. So I've got some examples here of how we look at blood flow or blood pressure through the brain, the cerebral perfusion pressure. And this is, the, this is the equation that pretty much governs 99% of what I do on neurointensive care. Cerebral perfusion pressure is the mean arterial pressure. And I'll do a little recap on mean arterial pressure in a moment. So that's the average blood pressure minus ICP, so the pressure in the brain within the skull. So we'll go through some examples. We've got a normal map, so a normal blood pressure of 80 millimeters of mercury. Our normal um, intracranial pressure is about 10, 10 to 15. So in this head injury example, I've set the ICP at 20. So that's raised, that's a raised ICP. Now the minimum cerebral perfusion pressure you need is about 60. So if we've got a normal blood pressure, we can tolerate a little bit of high ICP and we can still get that perfusion pressure that we need of 60. But Let's take that head injury example and use some different drugs um, to sedate or anaesthetize the patient. Now, propofol is my first example. Big Michael Jackson's favorite drug, he was a big fan of it, used for about 98% of general anesthetics up and down the country. Propofol causes direct myocardial uh, depression and it vasodilates you. So straight away, our mean arterial pressure has dropped from 80 to 70. Propofol probably lowers your ICP a little bit. So it's dropped from 20 to 18. But look at our cerebral perfusion pressure. You're starting to see with these examples just how critical blood pressure is in maintaining perfusion of the brain. I've got one more example. And no surprising, it's ketamine. I promise you, I'm not on any, um, I'm not getting any kickbacks from companies that make ketamine. This is, uh, this is entirely kickback free. Now, I've been a bit harsh here because we've said on that um, study that ketamine doesn't increase ICP. But for the sake of argument, let's say we're having an argument with someone who believes it does. I've set the ICP at 25. What, propofol, what ketamine does do is cause a small rise in blood pressure. So straight away, even though our ICP has gone up, which it probably wouldn't, we're still getting that cerebral perfusion pressure of 60 that we need. So the point of this is to highlight the importance of blood pressure and mean arterial pressure and um, in maintaining the perfusion across the brain. It's absolutely critical. And just to revise mean arterial pressure, the formula for that is the diastolic blood pressure, your bottom number, plus one third of the pulse pressure. The pulse pressure is the difference between the two. So on a worked example of a blood pressure of 120 over 70, 70 plus a third of that pulse pressure is 70 plus a third of 50, and that gives us a math of 86 millimetres of mercury, which is normal. Now, you cannot talk about cerebral um, pathophysiology without talking about the Monroe Kelly doctrine. I'm taking you back all the way to the a &P days when you were at uni, but this really is absolutely simple but critical to understand what's going on. The first box at the top of the screen 
shows the skull. <clears throat> and within the skull, there are four things. There's blood in the veins, there's blood in the arteries, there's the brain, which takes up the most uh, amount of space in the skull, and the cerebrospinal fluid. Now, on the second box down, what I've done is I've made the brain swell. Now, this could be swelling of the brain or it could be blood clot that's taken up extra space. But the point is that brain has taken up more space within the skull. Now, the skull can't get any bigger. It's fixed. It's a fixed box. So the body has got two ways to compensate for this. It can squeeze some of the CSF out down into the spine. And that's what I've shown here. That CSF compartment has got smaller. It can also squeeze out a bit of venous blood as well. And we look in the bottom box, the brain has swollen to the point where all the venous blood, or as much as can be squeezed out, has been squeezed out. And all the CSF has squeezed out and there's no more room. So this is the critical bit. The bottom box shows you a brain that's critical and about to die. Because look at this graph. This graph looks at the volume within the skull. So the volume within that fixed box and the pressure. So along the bottom axis, as volume goes up, there's a period where the, the, the body can compensate, squeezing out the CSF, it's squeezing out the venous blood. And then once those systems have been, um, once those systems have been overcome, that pressure shoots up. It's, it's got an epitope and it really does become an exponential rise. And you can see how quickly you get into the realms of focal ischemia and then global ischemia and ultimately brain death. So what's the role? So, What's the role of permissive hypotension? Because I've been banging on about how important blood pressure is, but we've spent years in trauma learning about permissive hypotension. Doesn't matter if the systolic's 85, that's absolutely fine. Not a problem, as long as they've got a radial pulse, get them to hospital. If there's a head injury, that's not the case. If we use those previous, um, if we use those previous equations that we've just learned to look at cerebral perfusion pressure and plug in these numbers so a blood pressure of 85 over 40 i take someone to hospital without giving them fluids if they've had a femoral artery stab wound and they've lost other blood if they were conscious they had a radial pulse and that was their blood pressure i wouldn't treat that i would just get them into the nearest mtc i'd be happy with that even if their map is 55 but now they've got a head injury as well They've been bullseyed on that car windscreen and the pressure within their head is 25. Now, we don't know that in the pre-hospital phase, but they're unconscious. So I'm going to go ahead and assume that they've got a raised ICP. If we plug those numbers in, then our cerebral perfusion pressure is 30. It's half of the minimum that we need. So we're in real shaky ground here now. And we're going to have a brain that's absolutely screaming out for oxygen and glucose and for CO2 to be taken away. So let's get back to our patient and um, uh, the agitated patient. And why are we going to sedate them? Well, it allows for control of big C, major hemorrhage. And if we control major hemorrhage, we're going to help maintain the mean arterial pressure, our, map, our blood pressure. It might allow us to maintain a patent airway and increase our SpO2. And the brain does not function without oxygen. It's exquisitely sensitive to changes in oxygen and saturations. And the same is true for CO2. So it allows us to effectively manage B if they're adequately sedated. We might need to support the ventilation. We might be able to put a Gadell in, maintain a patent airway so we're getting oxygen in and CO2 out. And again, it allows us to manage the circulation, same as the big C. It allows us to get a cannula in and if need be, give a fluid bolus. So sedating that agitated head injured patient can improve our neurological outcome as long as you're doing it to help you manage those ABCs and to get you into hospital. So how, how, what can we do once we've got our patients sedated if it's needed uh, and packaged and we need to get them to our, our nearest hospital or our MTC? Well, things that we can do, if we've got a good enough blood pressure, if this is an isolated head injury, what you might find 
is that they are usually quite hypertensive. The body is trying to push blood across the brain, across the style of resistor. So you will find that head injury patients do usually have stonkingly good blood pressures. So if they've got a decent enough blood pressure, try and transport the patient about 30 degrees head up. So this could be something as simple as they're probably going to be on a scoop because they're major trauma. If you can put a couple of rolled up um, uh, blankets under the head end of the scoop, just getting a little bit of head up or tilting the head of the trolley so the scoop itself is head up, that could do absolute wonders for improving the venous drainage. And as we said before, that venous blood leaving the head is one of our compensatory mechanisms. Now, the caveat to that is you need to make sure that the scoop is appropriately secured to the stretcher. So if you're unable to have a little bit of head up and appropriately secure your scoop to the stretcher with your, um, your uh, uh, seat belts, patient safety will take priority over the head up. So that's my little caveat to that. Um, tranexamic acid on route, one gram. Now, this very much depends on your PGD. Um, hopefully, if your PGD says major trauma and this patient ticks those major trauma boxes, that's great. If you look at an isolated head injury, we know that TXA is still of benefit if it's given within the three hours. Um, and it reduces head injury related deaths. And that's based on the CRASH-3 trial that was published last year or perhaps the year before, or maybe even the year before that. It's, oh, it's still pretty recent. Um, hopefully, PGDs will start to catch up with that evidence. I know NWAS hasn't yet for isolated head injuries, um, but it's, you know, things are getting there. Um, and smooth driving, I can't stress enough the importance of smooth driving and smooth driving at speed is a, a, a very difficult skill. Um, John's been in the car with me. He knows that I uh, can't do uh, smooth driving at speed. But for when you're transporting a patient, it's really important. Now, what I've done to illustrate that is I've turned our patient, our um, polytrauma patient with a head injury into a two litre bottle of Coca-Cola. Now, the Coca-Cola has been replaced with blood. And as you can see, our patient's lying on his side, uh, lying on the back, sorry, on the scoop stretcher in the back of the ambulance. They're half full because they've left half of their circul circulating volume at the scene. So they're hypovolemic. And our patient is being transferred forward. You're driving forward. So we've got that forward momentum. Now, if we think about where things are on this patient, as we're moving forward, and you can think about if you get a bottle of water and fill it halfway up and move it, all that water, and in our patient, all our blood is going to pool at the foot end. Now, unfortunately, the brain isn't in the feet. The brain is at the head end. So what we're doing by accelerating away hard is we're causing all the blood to be at the wrong end of the patient. But then someone will pull out at you, probably a Honda Jazz, at the traffic lights, and you'll have to drop anchor and stop very suddenly. And then what happens? All of the blood ends up at the head end of the patient. And we're going to get a big surge of blood going into the brain. And that's going to make the ICP go up. So although the brain is absolutely desperate for blood, um, what it doesn't like is big swings and changes. So that's the importance of smooth driving and avoidance of hard acceleration and heavy braking. So. What happens in the emergency department? Well, if we look at the goals of head injured patients in ED, it's basically the same stuff that we've already been doing. They're optimizing what we've started pre-hospitally. So that might mean giving blood, because remember, we're not gonna tolerate a low blood pressure if we think we've got a head injury. This is the point where the patient might be getting anesthetized. If their GCS is low, or if they're still agitated, then by giving them an anesthetic, we can optimize their oxygen delivery. We can um, optimize their CO2 removal and we can reduce the actual cerebral metabolic demands. So we can kind of put the brain into a bit of a hibernation state with an anesthetic, calm it down, reduce the amount of things that it's needing. So that will reduce the pressure within the brain. We can now get our 30 degree heads up, our A&E trolleys, the whole trolley will go like that. Um, and I think perhaps one of the most important things is the diagnosis. 
Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the uh, the role of the CT scan, and it's absolutely critical in these patients. But before then, I want to talk about my second controversy with head injured patients, and that's the collar, the extrication collar, and I've deliberately called it an extrication collar. Now, I've never seen anyone look this happy wearing uh, a cervical collar. She's far, far too happy to have a broken neck. So what is the role of the cervical collar? Because at the very beginning, it did say head injury patients. We know that they coexist with serious and life-threatening C-spine fractures. So what is the role of cervical collar? Well, do they prevent C-spine movement? No, they don't. The ones that we carry pre-hospitally that are flat packed in the back of our BLS bags, uh, they don't prevent C-spine movement. You've all put them on before. You put them on, you can easily turn your head 30 degrees to the left and to the right. Do they have a role for part of maxillofacial stabilisation? Yes, possibly. And this is when we're talking about big mid-face fractures when someone's really hit a steering wheel, they've got major bleeding. C-spine collars as a way of stabilising um, the mid-face probably does have a role. And did he have a role to help facilitate self-extrication of patients? Um, yeah, they probably do. Where you're unable to get mills on the patient, you're unable to get hands onto them. Um, but you want, to, uh, you want to get them out. You could put a collar on so they keep your head nice and still and get out the car for me. So I would never say they don't have any role whatsoever, um, but I think it's probably quite limited. Things they do do, they provide a really good visual stimulus. So if you see someone like this young lady here who's wearing a collar, you go, oh, they've got a broken neck and you're very careful with them. I know some services um, are replacing collars with a lanyard that says C-spine not cleared and just using the, um, the blocks and the tape. Um, and I think it's important to say that I am not referring to all collars. So the collars that we use within hospitals are much better fitted and much more effective. So the collar that uh, the lady in the photo is wearing is called an Aspen collar. Um, it's very expensive and it comes in a box, essentially. So they're not suitable for pre-hospital use. They come in about three parts as well. The ones we carry are a different beasts. They're much less effective and much less comfortable than these and much more poorly fitting. But what's the harm? I've said they're not very effective, but what is the harm? Well, it, it's quite interesting because we've got two patient groups. So if we've got a conscious patient, then the most effective thing to do is say, don't move your neck. And I go, okay, doctor, I won't move my neck. No problem. But we can tell someone who is conscious, don't move your neck. And if their neck is broken, it'll hurt. So they'll do a much better job of splinting it than we will. And we've got lots of good evidence to suggest as well that conscious patients will protect their own C-spine. Um, we can add in blocks and tapes, and these are usually pretty uh, sufficient for someone who's conscious. Um, and again, if they are conscious, we're less worried about intracranial pressure being raised. So if intracranial pressure was critically high, they probably wouldn't be conscious. Now, the unconscious patient is by definition not able to protect their C-spine, so should be fully immobilized, and that includes a collar. But the problem is by the, the very nature that these patients are unconscious, they're automatically at a higher risk of having that high ICP. And one thing we do know for sure is that collars do increase ICP. So this study was done on um, patients who were having their ICP measured so they were on an intensive care. They were in hospital. So that means the collars that were being used on these patients were the expensive, well-fitted ones, not the cheap, flat-pack, ill-fitting ones that we carry pre-hospitally. So just imagine what our collars are doing to ICP. Now, it's really important that we practice within the SOPs for the organisation that we're working for. And if our organization's SOP says we need to use collars, 
then what can we do? Well, first thing is we can seek advice from senior colleagues, senior clinicians. Second thing is we can ensure to the very best of our ability that the collars are as well fitting. If we have to use them, we need to go to the extra mile to make sure they're as well fitting as possible and not tight. The reason why they cause problems is because they impede the drainage, the venous drainage from the neck vessels. And going back to that Monroe Kelly, and we, we said a couple of times, the reason we see people up is because it's all about venous drainage to help that venous blood get out of the head. And it does actually say within JR Calc, you don't need to use the collar if it is going to be counterproductive. So if you've got someone and you look at them and think, I will never be able to get a collar to fit that neck, that's your justification for not using it. So again, I think this is another example of where we're going to see protocols and procedures start to catch up with the evidence that's coming through. And I think we will slowly start to see, and we already have seen this cervical collars move to more of a periphery of our practice rather than just every single patient getting a spinal collar. Now, in our patient journey, we are in the A&E department, and I thought this was a good time to just do a very brief interlude um, into a specific question that I've been asked. And that's what to do with head injuries when they're on antiplatelets. Do you take them into hospital um, for a CT scan or not? So I thought I'd look at what NICE said, and the NICE guidelines are great, they're really good, but they talk about anticoagulants and antiplatelets are not anticoagulants. So this um, clear guideline that any head injury, if you're on anticoagulants, you get in a CT scan. It just doesn't apply here. So it's not particularly helpful. But there's more within that document. They actually say there's very little evidence surrounding aspirin and clopidogrel and go as far to say that further research is suggested. And this is from 2014. And if you haven't seen this document, I really advise you to go and have a look at it. It's really well written. But it's 2014 and they've, they've identified uh, a knowledge gap there and said that further research is needed. So what does JR Calc say? Well, again, it's a little bit unhelpful. They don't automatically need assessment in hospital. You know, so it's not the same as patients who are on warfarin and uh, river oxaban, but have a lower threshold for conveyance of patients on dual antiplatelets. <clears throat> and the, uh, the politicians answer refer to local procedures. So I thought this is a good time to look at, well, what's the most recent evidence and what's the up-to-date evidence uh, suggesting? So this is quite a good, um, this is quite a good paper. This is from 2020. It's a retrospective analysis of patients seen by a trauma team for any head injury who are on antiplatelet therapy. Um, and they found that 41% of patients who were seen by the trauma team who were on antiplatelet therapy had some form of intracerebral hemorrhage, 41%, that's absolutely massive. And they found there was no difference between single or dual therapy. Now, the average rate of patients in this group was, uh, sorry, the average age of patients in this group was 76. So that potentially explains this higher rate. So do we need to do routine CT scanning for all head injured patients? I don't think so. That study was based in the US, not the UK, so it's not directly applicable. And also it was carried out in a level one, well, two level one trauma centers. So straight away, that study is selecting patient groups with higher energy levels. So how do we apply that to our decision making in the UK? I think the key here is to look at the energy involved. If it's an isolated head injury, how far have they fallen? Have they got a scalp injury as well? Has it been a bigger accident than they're making out? If they're on two antiplatelets, is that going to lower your threshold? Well, JR Calc says it should, but the evidence says it shouldn't. But hey, I think it's probably a safe thing to do to over triage these patients. And look at the social circumstances as well. Before we had CT scanners, what did we do with head injured patients? Well, we just kept an eye on them. We put them on the OBS unit and we looked at them and they either went unconscious or they didn't. 
So if they've got a responsible adult with them who can keep an eye on them, you may be more inclined to leave them at home. And age, I think that what that study does show us is that elderly patients who are on antiplatelets and have had a reasonable injury, even if everything looks normal, I'm more inclined to push them towards transporting in. So I hope that helps. I hope that answers that little segue uh, of a question. But let's talk about uh, the CT scanner. This is probably the most important scan of the patient's journey. And the sooner they get there, the better. And you might find there's a bit of a compromise sometimes between resuscitating that patient in resource and getting them in the scanner so we know what's actually going on with them. Now, I'm going to go through the different types of bleed and brain injury that we see. And the first one is bruising. So the lungs can get bruising, your muscles can get bruising, your internal organs can bruise, the brain is the same, you get contusions. And what we do see is however bad they look on day one, they are gonna look worse on day three and four. They bloom and they grow as time goes on. And I mentioned at the beginning this contra coup injury. So that's an injury sort of almost at the opposite side of um, where the impact was on the head. So I've got this CT scan here. You can see on the right hand side, you can see a big scalp hematoma. So you've got the skull as the bright white line and then there's a big scalp hematoma. So that's clearly where this person's hit their head or been hit, say it was a baseball bat. The injury, the blood, the white line is on the other side of the head. So that's a contra coup injury. This is an extradural hematoma. So you can see it's biconvex. It kind of looks like a lens. And that's blood that's confined to an area within the skull where the dura, the thick fibrous layer that covers the brain, it covers the brain, but it anchors at various points in the skull and connects to it. So what you've got there is a bleed that has bled, but it's been kept within the boundaries of the dura. And we see this with um, skull fractures, temporal bone fractures, and what they damage is the middle meningeal artery. So this is an arterial bleed within the head. So it's very fast and very dangerous. And it, this has been called talk and die syndrome. So the patient bangs their head, they're walking around at the scene, you're looking at them, you're asking about their past medical history, who do they live with, who's their GP, and bang, they drop the GCS to three and hit the deck because this is quite a fast evolving uh, situation. Now the opposite of that is the subdural hematoma. So this, you can see the blood on the right hand side follows all the way around that right hand side of the brain. It's not got any bits of dura confining it to one area. So it's the neck level down, it's underneath the dura, the subdural hematoma. And these are usually due from bridging veins that go from the brain to the skull. Um, or the brain to the dura. And as a brain shrinks with age, with dementia, or with alcoholism, or with dehydration, those veins become stretched and tortuous. So a little jiggle around in the head and those veins can break. So we see this, and these can be acute or chronic. So when you see Mrs. Miggins, 75 year old, who fell two or three weeks ago, but now she's got slurred speech, she's confused, and she's got a facial droop. That's a chronic subdural hematoma. This is a subarachnoid bleed. So this is the next level down on the layers that cover the, uh, the brain. And you can see the blood now, the white bits have gone all the way down and followed into the folds of the brain. Now, these are, we do see these with traumatic injuries, but these are usually due to an aneurysm that has burst. And what we would like to do when we see these we don't always assume that if we see this and they've been in an accident, it's a traumatic injury. Sometimes what can happen is an aneurysm can burst and cause a subarachnoid bleed. But did the bleed cause the accident or did the accident cause the bleed? So we go hunting for that aneurysm. And then again, Penetrating injuries, they're very, very subtle. You can't always see them on scans, but I've, I've found some quite subtle scans here. And if you look very carefully, you can just see some penetrating injuries. So if we see 
signs of a raised intracranial pressure on the scan or through the physical signs that Cushing's reflex, the very, very high blood pressure, the very slow heart rate, the bradycardia, and unequal pupils, these are very late and critical signs. If we see that in the A&E department or on the scan, then what can we do to buy time? Well, we can shrink the brain down. So if we think about our boxes, we've run out of getting CSF out, we've run out of getting the venous blood out. The only thing we can do is either open the box, but that's going to take us a little bit of time, or we can shrink the brain back down. And we do that by dehydrating it. There's two things we can give. We can give sugar, so mannitol. Mannitol is a big sugar molecule. Or we can give some very, very strong saline, three or 4% saline. It's called hypertonic saline. And what that does is that dehydrates the brain. It sucks water out of the brain via osmosis. And it buys you an hour or so to get the patient to theatre. And at the moment, we don't really know what's better, mannitol or hypertonic saline. And if you ask 10 different people, they'll probably give you a, a, an even split on the answer or perhaps more favouring to hypertonic saline. But there's this study going on at the moment, the SOS trial, sugar or salt. And this is uh, one of the studies that we're doing at the Walton Centre um, it's going up Salford Royal as well and about 15 other places throughout the country or neuro centres. Um, and we're looking at those with traumatic brain injuries. We're measuring the pressure in the head and we're randomising them to mannitol or hypertonic saline. And uh, hopefully we should find out uh, which one's the best. So after our A&E trip, where are we going to go with our patients? Are they going to go to theatre for an operation or are they going to go to intensive care? Do they need an operation now? later or not at all. Let's look at some of the, uh, the operations that are done. Craniotomies and craniectomies, although they sound very similar, are two quite different operations. The start of the operation is pretty much the same. We're taking off a bone flap. Now, a craniotomy is we're taking off part of the skull, a bone flap, to remove a mass lesion. And in this patient group, um, we're talking about blood. But this is also the same operation if you had a brain tumour. You'd have a craniotomy to get to the brain um, and then take your tumor out, uh, tuna, tube, tumour out. And at the end of the operation, the bone flap that was taken off is put back on and it's bolted back together with some Meccano. And this can be an elective or an emergency procedure. Now, a craniectomy is an emergency life-saving procedure to relieve swelling on the brain. So if we think about our Monroe Kelly boxes, this is the operation to open up that box. It's a much bigger bone flap that comes off. And at least in the initial phases, the bone flap isn't replaced. And I'll talk a little bit more about that when I've got some slides later on. And we can either do this early or late. And this operation can be life-changing and life-saving. And there's some quite, um, quite interesting ethical issues with this. Um, and I'd, I'll talk a little bit more about those in the next few slides. So this is what the craniotomy looks like. You can see there are clips around the edge um, and that's because the scalp really, really loves to bleed. So the scalp has been taken back you can see the skull underneath it and a hole has been drilled in that skull. And you've got the really thick covering. So that's the dura, and the dura has been opened up and we can see the brain underneath it. And if we were removing a blood clot, that is where we would see that blood clot. Now, one of the operations they can do is to remove, uh, to fix a depressed skull fracture. So if you've got a, piece of your skull that is pushing down into the brain that's going to cause that part of the brain to not function so it's important to elevate those depressed fractures now you can fix these and put them back together using Meccano or you could just leave it because essentially what you've done here is you've not taken the lid off the box but you have fractured that lid so that does allow the brain to swell a little bit more but one of the things they are keen on doing is making sure that it's as clean as possible. 
So they used loads and loads of wash and um, irrigate to try and get it as clean as possible so you don't end up with an infected skull uh, and subsequent brain abscesses. Uh, and they will take away at this point um, uh, non-survivable tissue that's going to die. Now, back to the craniectomy. This is what a craniectomy looks like after the operation. So they've taken off an enormous bone flap and allowed the brain to swell out and they closed the scalp. And then over time, what's happened is the brain has had room to swell, but now it's gone back to normal. And what you can see is they're left with an absolutely enormous deficit. Now, what I want you to do for the next couple of minutes while I show you another slide is I just want you to think about survival versus good survival. So there's survival in that you have lived at the end of this, but then what, me, what is a good survival to you? Is it going back to work as a paramedic or is it just being alive, um, being hoist transferred, having permanent disability, not being able to communicate? Communicate, uh, communicate, just think about what is a good survival to you. And the declaration here is that I'm a neuro ICU consultant. I am by my very nature, incredibly pessimistic. So my view is skewed on this. Um, and also it, it's very, we'll, we'll talk about that uh, on a, some coming slides. So just spend the next couple of minutes thinking what's a good survival to you. Um, this is a uh, bear holes. Uh, so this is a very simple operation um, where small holes are drilled into the skull, usually two, over the site of that subdural hematoma. And the two holes allows you to irrigate. So you put water in one hole, and it comes out the other and it flushes out the blood clot. Now, because these patients might be very old, they've got a lot of comorbidities, um, you can actually do this operation awake. Uh, using local anaesthetic to perform a scalp block, so some injections around the, the front and side of the head. Um, and this is one of the oldest operations that we know about. We've found prehistoric skulls that have burr holes in them. And we know they've survived as well because we can actually see healing on the side of them. So I really love to wind up my surgical colleagues by telling them, a caveman can do your job, mate. Now, neurocritical care. So this is where I apply my trade if I'm not in theatre um, or out on the road. What do we do in neurocritical care? Well, we give people time and that's pretty much it. You're either going to get better or you're not, but it's really difficult to work out who is going to get better and who isn't. So that's why we need to give people time. It's so difficult to prognosticate and try and predict who's going to get better based just on CT scans. We manage people's ICP a little bit more advanced than neurocritical care. Um, and we're very heavily involved in organ donation when people are declared brain dead. And this is the start of the patient's real journey. Up to neurocritical care, this could be a matter of three, four, five, six hours for their injury to get here. But this, from this point onwards, we can be talking years. And what makes critical care a great place to be if you're a patient is everybody's there, everybody that you need. And in my opinion, it's the best example of multidisciplinary working. We've got neurosurgeons who are there and all the other surgical specialties as well. So if we've got a polytrauma patient, we've got our trauma surgeons, orthopedic surgeons, ENT surgeons. We've got critical care nurses who, as well as looking after the patients, um, managing their medications, managing their ventilators, uh, they are in charge of the chocolate and biscuits for the whole unit, which is a massively important role. We have doctors on there and advanced critical care practitioners uh, who come from a really wide variety of backgrounds. Lots of them are intensive care nurses who have done some extra training to prescribe and and work at a, a sort of similar level to the, uh, the, the doctors on the intensive care unit. Um, I know there are some paramedics who have done ACCP training and at the Walton Centre we're really lucky. Um, we've got amazing ACCPs. Um, we have physiotherapists who are just um, incredible at what they do. Um, they're incredible at getting people off ventilators. They do respiratory physio. 
as far as I'm concerned, it's basically dark magic how they achieve what they achieve with patients. And they work really closely with the speech and language people as well. Um, and we've got some of the best pharmacists in the hospital on intensive care. They regularly stop us doctors making really silly uh, prescribing errors. So we're really, really grateful for them. But let's look at the way we do our ICP management. Uh, the picture on the top right is what's called an ICP bolt. It is a tiny, tiny hole that is drilled through the skull. And through that hole, you put a transducer wire. And that wire just turns a pressure signal from the pressure within the brain, within the skull, into an electrical signal. And it looks like a, a wave on the monitor. And you see that that's exactly what we look at when we look at ICP. And we have a very protocolized treatment on what we do. So tier zero for anyone with raised ICP is sort of basic ITU type stuff. We intubate and ventilate them so we control their O2 and CO2. And we make sure they're really well sedated so the brain's not working hard. We put them head up. We take the collar off if the surgeon's left us. Uh, and when we're rolling the patient, we roll them in line so that they don't turn the head this way or the other so that these uh, vessels remain, uh, the drainage, drainage within the vessels remains patent. And we monitor things very closely. Now, if despite all that, our ICP goes up, uh, we make sure that we're maintaining our cerebral perfusion pressure by manipulating blood pressure. So we make sure that we've got enough MAP to keep our CPP between 60 and 70. We can increase our sedation to calm the brain down a little bit more. Um, and osmotherapy. Osmotherapy is the mannitol and hypertonic saline so we can dehydrate the brain. If that's still not working, then we move on to tier two. And this is where we start getting into surgery. And I've got some, uh, I asked you before to think about what survival means to you. And we'll come on to that. Um, we can paralyze people using drugs to paralyze them because any small amount of movement might be enough. Any cough on the ventilator might be enough to just increase the pressure within the head. If you imagine that you're, um, if you put your thumb in your mouth and try and blow out, you can feel the pressure in your head. So that's why we really don't want people to cough or try and breathe against our ventilators. Um, one of the things we do is we, we cool people down as well we maintain their temperature at a at either a normal or a low normal um route and again that's all due to that's all part of keeping the brain nice and calm and then in tier three we can either reconsider surgery do more surgery or put the patient into a barbiturate coma and that is literally turning the brain off uh, using incredibly powerful and really really nasty drugs to just absolutely zap the brain and make sure it's doing no work whatsoever. Now, decompressive craniectomy. I've alluded to this a few times and that's because it's, I wouldn't say controversial, but it's a really important part of the decision-making that we have to do with the, um, the surgeons and patients' families on neurocritical care. Um, the first trial that I want to mention is a trial called Rescue ICP. And in this trial, they took patients with traumatic brain injuries with CT changes and a high ICP, so it was over 25, despite the basic things that we do, tier zero, tier one, tier two. And they were between 10 and 65 years old. And they divided them into two groups. The intervention group had that decompressive craniectomy, that big operation that leaves you with an enormous defect. Um, and the control group received the medical side of things. So that's all the stuff I was just mentioning, uh, the barbiturate coma, the cooling, uh, the sedation, et cetera. And what the results showed that if you do a decompressive craniectomy, you are more likely to survive. But, and this is the really important bit, there are increased rates of permanent vegetative state. So never really regaining consciousness, but being alive, and having severe disability. And the DECRA trial as well, it was a little bit older than Rescue ICP. Again, this looked at traumatic brain injury um, with uh, high ICP, 15 to 59 years old. And they did a standardized surgical intervention. So they did an enormous 
decompress the craniectomy. So a bifrontotemporal parietal. So they're removing the whole front of the skull. And at six months, the mortality uh, was about the same. They had less time on intensive care and they had a less time with a high pressure in their head, raised ICP. But they had a lower Glasgow outcome score. So that's not the same as um, GCS. That's talking about severe disability and unfavourable outcomes. So similar to the last study, again, you're, more likely, you're either more likely to survive or equally likely to survive, according to this study, but you're going to have a more unfavourable outcome, more severe disability. So that's why I ask you to think about what does survival mean to you? And this is one of the most difficult topics. There's an inter-surgeon variability about who, who's more likely to do uh, decompressive craniectomies. And my personal view about what I would like to live with and what is acceptable for me is not right or wrong. That's just me and what is acceptable to me. And it's very difficult not to try not to impose those views on other people. So we really do, um, we really do have some ethical issues uh, with uh, neuro ICU and neurosurgery. And if you think about what, what's acceptable to you, what degree of disability is acceptable to you, the most important thing is to talk to your loved ones about it. Because if you're in a coma, we will be asking loved ones, what do you think he would say or she would say if they were here and we could ask them about what they would want. Um, I'll just uh, mention this uh, briefly. An extraventricular drain is one of the things that we can do to help drain the CSF uh, from the head. And on the picture, you can see the ICP bolt that I mentioned before. The EVD, the extraventricular drain, goes in further and it goes right into the ventricle in the middle of the brain and it just allows the flow of CSF out. So again, what you're doing is you're optimising that CSF part of your Monroe Kelly. Some people uh, need an EVD forever and what we can do is we can actually internalise that um, and that's what becomes the VP shunt. So if you hear patients say, I've got a VP shunt, they've got something in the ventricle of their brain that drains the fluid and it normally drains um, into, their, into their tummy, into their uh, peritoneum. So waking patients up is often the most difficult bit. So they might have been asleep for ages. We've been um, treating their ICP in all the ways we've said. They may or may not have had surgery. And it's very difficult to get them awake. And what we see is a lot of agitation in these patients. So we use lots and lots of oral sedatives that we give uh, nasogastrically. So diazepam, oromorph, clonidine, you know, um, antipsychotic medicine, medicines and sedative medications. But not everyone is awake enough to have that breathing tube out. So say we have someone with a, a GCS of eight or nine. Are we going to keep them intubated for months at a time? Because at the beginning I said, um, one of the things that uh, we do on neuro ICU is give people time. Well, we can't keep them intubated and sedated for months and months and months. So what we do is tracheostomies to make sure that their airway is safe. And then they can have a tracheostomy for months and months um, for as long as they need uh, to, to get into neuro rehab and recover. And some people will have tracheostomies for the rest of their lives, but we do move to get them out. Um, I'm going to just skip over that. Um, and, and yeah, I think, as I mentioned, the neuro ITU really is the start of the journey. So after they've spent some time with us on ICU, uh, a large portion of patients will then go into rehab and that can take months and it can take years. Um, and getting back into community, uh, to being at home and being at work really is an absolutely enormous step. Um, so we like to remember that brain injuries really, really can impact on um, on the family. But we don't win every battle. Um, people, and we've said it's a, a, at the very, very beginning of the talk, mentioned it's a very low number of people who die because of their brain injury. Um, but ultimately, some people do die and go on to become organ donors because we've got this young, fit patient cohort 
And we're in quite a unique battle in that we have the potential for what's called donation after brainstem death. So the old terms here, donation, um, so we have two terms, donation after brainstem death, and donation after cardiac death. Donation after cardiac death is when the heart has stopped beating, the patient goes on to be an organ donation. Donation after brain death is when the patient is legally declared dead. However, their heart is still beating. So the old terms of this was heart beating donation or non heart beating donation. And as you could probably imagine, donating your organs taken at the very last second while the heart is still beating provides the best possible organs for transplantation. Um, so my, my, the, the drum that I'm banging here is please talk to your loved ones, irregardless about your views of um, organ donation. Um, please, please, please talk to your loved ones about what your views are, because if you, you know, heaven forbid, ever end up on neurointensive care, it's your loved ones that we have to talk to, to try and understand what it is that you would want in those circumstances. Um, I'll skip through brainstem testing and I'll summarise what it is we've covered. Um, so we've looked at our patient's journey from the injury they've had at the roadside how we get them to hospital and then what happens in the A&E department and what sort of brain injuries we can see on the CT scans. We've had a little look at what happens in the operating theatre and then uh, briefly touch on what happens on the intensive care unit. Things we haven't covered are mild to moderate brain injuries. I could have spent uh, an hour and 10 minutes talking about concussion alone we haven't looked at all of the physiology. And if you want to look more into it, look up cerebral autoregulation because that gives you the framework to hang everything else on. We've not looked at the very young and the very old because they are very special patient groups. And we haven't really touched on what happens after the patient leaves the intensive care unit. Um, and we haven't looked at any one area in any great depth. We just don't have the time. If you're interested in looking up a little bit more, then the Brain Trauma Foundation is pretty much the Bible for how to manage uh, brain injuries uh, from intensive care to, to theatre and, and a little bit pre-hospital as well. So do have a look at their website. Um, the two studies regarding uh, decompressive craniectomies, Rescue ICP and DECRA are available online. Um, and if you're interested in uh, looking up a bit more about them, there's a really good summary of Rescue ICP on uh, the bottom line. Um, so thank you ever so much. I'm ever sorry I ran over a little bit there, uh, John. Um, I, I hope most most people have uh, stayed stayed with us. We've got a similar number of people. Um, I hope no one's brain dead after that. Um, and I'd uh, love to take any questions you've got for me. Stop work, John. Thank you very much. Um, so yeah, we've got a few questions, and to be perfect, some of these may have. have been answered already um, from uh, uh, from your talk as it's gone on. So uh, first one, can ketamine make head injury patients more agitated? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Yes, it can. Um, that's, you know, giving it with a benzo, so ketamine and midazolam uh, is usually uh, a good choice. Um, I don't see it as often as the textbooks would suggest if you read a textbook about ketamine and um agitation you would seem to think that every single person you give ketamine to goes absolutely wild and that's not really played out in clinical practice it certainly can do um and if it does then you need to treat that agitation with uh, a benzo and midazolam being the first choice but head injured patients aren't any more prone to ketamine-induced um, agitation than any other patient will be. Super. Uh, next one is regarding an intoxicated patient who's fallen from the sixth step. GCS7 was protecting their own airway, no posturing, um, vitals normal, no uh, unequal dilation of the eyes. Um, uh, this person decided to take the patient on a pre-alert to a major trauma centre rather than waiting for the HEMS car at 3am in the morning. Uh, after 15 minutes, the patient became agitated in the ambulance Ambulance. It was then felt they made a bad decision. A uh, patient did get an RSI at the MTC, um, but that was for um, the CT pan scan. Um, so um, should uh, the patient have received the RSI earlier? Oh, 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 too many factors. 
So uh, we, we, it's, we've got another hour and a half, John, is that right? <laughs> yeah. Um, that's a really difficult um, scenario. Um, that's a really difficult scenario. Uh, it, it, the, the, problem, the problem with looking at that particular scenario is retrospective medicine is the easiest type of medicine that you could possibly do. Um, ult- ultimately, um, things you can, you know, en route. So that the purpose of the RSI is to reduce the amount of work the brain's doing optimize the oxygenation and optimize the co2 removal if you've got someone with a low gcs um, and you think you're in a position to go uh, you can still support that patient's ventilation with a bag valve mask um, uh, to, to keep their oxygenation up to keep the co2 down even if they're breathing spontaneously and you don't need an rsi to do that so you know, the, the time, I'm, I'm not convinced that an early RSI is necessarily what the patient needs. My, and I've may, I may very well be treading on some toes here. Um, but what I think the patient needs is the CT scan. Unless you know what you're dealing with, then no amount of RSIs, manitol surgery uh, is going to make the patient better. So I think the desire to get the patient to the CT scanner as quickly as possible um, uh, is, a, is a, a perfectly admirable one. Was that appropriately political enough, John? Yeah, I think so. Uh, and, and we could argue this out for hours quite happily uh, working in a critical care service. Um, uh, yeah, we could. Um, uh, but lots of factors to take into consideration. Um, you know, discuss it with your top cover um, and, and make that decision. And as John said, you know, that um, retrospectoscope is, is is brilliant. And, you know, hindsight is a wonderful thing. You know, you could have transported the patient in and there wouldn't have been an issue. You could have transported the patient five minutes down the road and the patient could have turned it and then um, you you're on to a, a loser so yeah i uh, i completely agree john um quickly moving on then uh, impact of helicopters on icp um not the helicopters but potentially potentially the vibration from the helicopters um however i think it's probably minimal um in in summary the short answer to that is i think it's uh, probably minimal certainly no issues with altitude um and potentially your helicopter transfer may be smoother than an ambulance accelerating and decelerating through um, heavy traffic. Yeah, absolutely. We we fly neuro RSI patients uh, if need be, um, uh, depending on what else we need to do with them. So, uh, so yeah. Adam, I, I would love to put an ICP bolt in a patient and then fly them around for a little bit. That would be... Uh, It'd be ropey on ethical grounds to get approval for that, but it'd be a very interesting study. I'm sure someone's looking at it somewhere. Um, <laughs> uh, how do you weigh up treating the agitated patient uh, versus waiting on scene for critical care and transporting to the ED? Um, it yeah. depends how far away they are, um, <laughs> is, uh, is, I think it's the key to that. And it also depends on the trajectory of the patient, um, as I said. But either, you know, you could wait, 20 minutes for a critical care team to get there and that patient can go down those one of those three routes they could have got better got worse or stayed the same um and if you look at a patient for two or three minutes i mean john i don't know you and i have done a head injured a teenager haven't we and we spent about three or four minutes just looking at him seeing what the trajectory of him was um and he got a little bit better but not uh not enough to safely trans uh transfer so um that, that's that's the other uh, discriminator as well is um is that patient safe to transfer with that level of agitation um and that's very much that on the ground decision you know are you able to safely transfer um irregardless of whether or not you're meeting those cabcd goals uh winner will rattle through these uh uh haloperidol for non-compliant head injuries uh, too slow to work. So I know London are using haloperidol um, uh, pre-hospitally, but I believe, uh, and I'm, I very much apologise if I'm wrong on this, but I le- believe that's for ABD. Um, haloperidol for agitated head injury? Probably not. No, I think it's too slow um, uh, to take effect. Um, 
that I think we've got we've got other drugs that do the same job probably better. Um, I'm not sure what haloperidol does to ICP. Um, probably not much. I would have thought so it's probably safe. Uh, I just think you're on uh, untested ground. Winner. Um... Uh, some comments on not applying collars to reduce ICP, we've, uh, which we've talked about. Uh, given antiemetics to your head injury patients, absolutely. yeah, one hundred percent, yeah, absolutely. And uh, you know, anyone you're strapping down to a board um, on Danzatron, absolutely fine in head injuries. Uh, cyclozine, um, if anything, it will give you a little bit of a boost in blood pressure, probably from the tachycardia. So again, uh, if you if you use cyclozine in your service, um, that probably fine. Uh, metoclopramide I'd have it at the very bottom of my list I think on Dan Strong would be a much better choice yeah um, uh, any role in giving plasma to head injuries um, oh no yes um, I, I don't want to step on the toes of uh, the refill trial um, obviously refill uh, blood is just as effective as salty water. That's the headline from Refill. Um, however, I think if you took a, uh, I think it might be a different story if you took uh, the subgroup of head injured patients and then looked at um, blood plus or minus plasma uh, versus salty water. Um, your hypertonic saline in this in this group, um, there might be a, a, an added benefit because your hypertonic saline will act as a little bit like a volume expander, so it might maintain your blood pressure a little bit. Um, plasma, whether it's FFP or Lyoplas specifically, I think, yes, it's got a role as long as that role is maintaining the mean arterial pressure. Winner. Um, uh, I'm going to... We, we've got loads and loads. I'm going to uh, draw it um, uh, to a close on this last one. So uh, any use for hyperventilating, uh, hyperventilating isolated head injury patients? Um, so you should aim for a low normal um, end tidal CO2. Hyperventilation to, low, uh, to, to um, hypocapnia um, does have a role, but that role is as a rescue therapy. So if you are transferring in a head injury and you look down and you see that a pupil has blown, so they are imminently in the process of coning, so their, their brainstem is being forced through the bottom of their skull, that is a time when it is, as, a, as an absolute last-ditch attempt, I would be turning my respiratory rate up to 22, I'd be turning my tidal volumes up to 600, 650, and I'd be getting that CO2 as low as it can. It is a temporizing measure and it may have delirious effect, deleterious effects uh, further down the line. But hey, if the patient's coning the back of the ambulance, further down the line is someone else's problem and you might be able to get some uh, hypertonic saline in by that time. So yes, it does have a role, but it's a, a very, very last step. Winner, winner. Um, super, that, uh, that's been chose, really... Show some good questions there, John. Thank you. Ab absolutely. I'm good like that. Um, so, uh, fantastic. And thank you so much to, uh, uh, to John for giving up his time uh, tonight to, uh, to cover this webinar for us. Um, I'm just going to wrap up by saying thank you to all of you for um, uh, joining us tonight. Um, please remember to um, rate us on um, Trustpilot, uh, on the Google Store, on the um, Apple, Ice, uh, Apple App Store. Um, uh, to be in a chance of winning one of those two uh, £25 um, vouchers for Amazon. And um, yeah, check out our website and you will see uh, all our forthcoming webinars, which you can register for. Um, for those of you on shift, because I know there is some of you, um, have a very safe one. Um, and um, uh, for the rest of you, have a good evening, uh, the rest of it, and uh, sleep well. Cool. Thank you very much. Thanks everyone. very much, everyone. Good night.